So rebellion uh, leads to witchcraft. Witchcraft is assuming the role of God. Hmm? It's a desire to manipulate and control. That's what witchcraft is. It's a desire to, re excuse me, to revenge oneself by doing evil. The desire to obtain power. And America is bent on power. Everybody in America wants money and power. They want to control their own life, and they want to control everybody else. This is the most power-hungry people in the world in this country. Um, it is terrible. Even poor people, even people that have not got two nickels to rub together, are craving for power and money. Uh, the poor people of this country, I'm not picking on them, I'm just saying they're as guilty of greed as the rich people are. They are, because it's like they want to be rich so bad, just like the rich people want to be richer. Uh, it's just we, I, and I, and I, because I'm a part of this country, I ask God forgive us all. It's just such a, a terrible act of rebellion and sin. It's a spirit of witchcraft over this nation. Nobody, I'm not saying they pray to witches. I'm not saying that they participate in witchcraft. But it is the spirit of witchcraft. It's to manipulate and control people with money and with, with, with businesses that have an opportunity to steal from people and to manipulate people. It's amazing now how that um, everywhere you go, at least this is my experience, they want to sell you a warranty when you buy something. Some cheap little useless warranty. Have you ever tried to use one? Well, let me tell you. It's a cheap little useless warranty. <laughs> if you ever try to use it, it's a cheap little useless warranty. You can't get them to honor it. You can't get them to do anything with them once you... I'm just saying. I mean, they'll sell you a warranty on a pencil if you'll let them. They'll sell you a warranty on anything. And it may not be much, but that's because it ain't going to do nothing. And what I'm saying is, it's like, it's like any way to get a few more dollars out of you. But they won't give you anything for it. And that's the attitude of America now. It's like everything is that way. Everything is so expensive now. Cars are expensive. But there ain't, there ain't no metal on a car no more. You know? It's like, you ever tap on your car? It's plastic. If you're lucky, it's aluminum. <laughs> you know? I mean, I'm like, I'm going, I'm looking at my car, and I thought, my, my, my car I got there, I'm like, do you know, the, the, this? I'm, I'm thinking, this is pretty nice in the front. It's got all this chrome, and I reached over to touch it, and it's cheap plastic. The chrome is not chrome. It's shiny plastic. I thought, you know what? Some Chinese man made this for 50 cents. <laughs> I, I don't know what it costs, but I'm thinking, I'm thinking, you know, this is terrible, isn't it? This is terrible. Well, I don't mean to be too critical about it, but, but really, this is what we've come to. Is, is, is like everything, everything now. Um, well, I'm getting off track. Witchcraft is insubordination. One becomes his own authority. One's ambition becomes his governing power. Rebellion and, wit and rejection are two roots that produce schizophrenia in the personality. Shenzhen means to cleave, split. And friend means mind. It's to split the mind. Rejection turns a person inward. Loneliness, timidity, shyness, self-pity, fantasy, lust, insecurity, negative self-image, self-rejection, self-hatred, fear of rejection, jealousy, envy, depression, and suicide. It just divides the mind. Rebellion turns a person outward. They, become, they, they, have, they begin to experience hatred, violence, murder, bitterness, and unforgiveness. Control, possessiveness, witchcraft, self-willed, unteachable, proud, self-delusion, self-deception, and perversion. What, what happens with, with uh, rebellion is a person begins set on their own agenda and their own goal at the expense of, no, uh, of everybody else. What we, what we see uh, as we relate it to the local church or even to a family or even in, on the job, if you've, ever, if you've ever come up against this, is uh, rebellion usually sets itself on accomplishing its own agenda and, uh, and, and it'll, it'll stop at no ends. You'll have an, a kind of an Absalom spirit. You remember Absalom, the, uh, the son of uh, David? 
Absalom got it in his mind that he wanted to be king. And you know what? He may have been king if he had been patient and done it God's way and waited on the Lord to promote him. God has a way of, in his own time, preparing us and making us ready for promotion. But instead, Absalom used the anointing on his life to, to try to self-promote himself out of rebellion. And you know the story. His golden, beautiful, long-flowing hair represented his anointing. And anointing always attracts people. And usually, when God has placed someone like King David in authority, there's a great overflow of anointing. There's a great overflow of anointing. And God will have people like Absalom who serve under the one who's anointed. There will be people in a church. There will be people that will work in a corporation that will serve under the one who's carrying the anointing because God has placed them there. And they're there to be mentored. They're there to be prepared. Just like David, excuse me, sat under Saul. And God anointed David long before it was time for him to come to the throne. You remember that? Um, God anoints him, but it wasn't time. And David refused to even cut, uh, to even uh, touch the anointing of Saul because he understood it's God who promotes a man. Uh, the scripture says in Psalms that promotion comes, in Psalm 75, promotion comes neither from the east nor the west, but from the Lord who sets down one who puts down one and, and sets up another. Okay? So it's the Lord who promotes. It's not the king. It's not the pastor. It's not the boss who promotes you. If you'll be patient and wait on the Lord and wait on your timing, God will promote you. Nobody can stop it and nobody can cause it. So you be patient, wait on the Lord. David understood that. And when it was time, all of Israel placed him in as king over the whole nation. Now, he did become king. I believe it was of, of uh, Judah, uh, one of one of the tribes, you know, earlier. But that was uh, that was God's plan. But to be over all the tribes, it was to wait on the Lord for that to happen. So Absalom, he gets in his mind that he's going to overthrow the throne, and he's going to, uh, through rebellion, he's going to take the throne from his father. And of course, you know the story. He begins to intercept people coming to his father for counsel by standing outside of the gate. And this is what people will do when they're rebellious. They'll start making comments like, like, like Absalom did. Oh, my father, you know, he's getting a little old. <laughs> you know, he, I, I've got some fresher counsel. I've got some good advice for you. Uh, just come over to me and I'll, I'll give you some wisdom and some advice. And, and, and he began to, you know, just spread rumors and things like that. He began to inter, intercept people. And, uh, and he began to usurp the authority of his father. Well, you know how it goes. The story, before long, um, the whole thing interrupts. And Absalom is fleeing. And uh, Joab is fleeing after Absalom. And Absalom's hair is blowing in the wind. And, you know, it gets caught in a branch. And he's pulled off the horse and he's hanging there. And, he, and Joab pierces him through and he dies. And so the very anointing, that was meant for him probably to rule and reign over Israel in his right appropriate time as God would promote him uh, was the very thing that caused him to lose his life. And the story behind that is that you have to be careful because the anointing that would cause you to rule could also be the, the very same thing that might cause you to be ruined um, if you misuse it. You know, there's just that possibility there. So, rebellion is not a thing to play with when it comes to uh, God's anointing. It's very, very, uh, very, very strong caution that we want to look at. But it happens sometimes in churches. I, uh, we've all seen it happen. I had a, a guy when I pastored in East Texas. Uh, I love this guy. He was my assistant pastor, a great assistant pastor. Situation happened. Uh, him and his wife had some problems. On Sunday morning, the adult Sunday school class ran 200. And he was the adult Sunday school teacher. He, he was teaching 200 people every Sunday morning. That's a pretty good, pretty good, pretty good little class to teach, you know. And uh, he was ministering to 200 people every week. And um, he and his wife had some problems, and she left him. Uh, and about six months passed, and been trying to get the two of them to come for counseling but she wouldn't come 
And so anyway, long story short, all of a sudden he comes in one Wednesday night and he says, we're getting back together. And I said, well, that's great. What happened? And he said, well, um, she just, we've just been talking. She wanted me to come. And I could tell he didn't want to, he didn't want to tell me, which is very strange because we were very close. And anyway, he, anyway, he says, but after church tonight, I'm moving back in. Well, so the next thing I know, he didn't show up to work the next day at the church. I knew something, something was wrong. I didn't see him again for, well, I didn't see him again until like Saturday, I think it was. And he called and he said, uh, I'm not coming back. I said, what? And he said, well, you know, we've decided that to make our marriage work, we're going to uh, uh, pull out, of the, I'm going to pull out of the church and we're going we're gonna to do something else. And it was just real short and to the point. And I thought, this is, this is weird. I said, well, why don't, you, why don't you guys come and talk to me or something? No, nah, we're just going to take some time off and just kind of get to know each other new again. And, you know, just say, and that was the end of the conversation. Two weeks passes, and I hear that he, has, he, that he and her are starting a church 12 miles down the road, and 50 of my people are going with them. <laughs> and they did, and 50 people left. Um, and uh, their church lasted one year, and by the time they closed it, they were down to like 12 people. The, the sad thing was, the church didn't work. He went from ministering to 200 people to 50. The sad thing was, only one family after that came back to our church. So we lost 50 people. Um, his ministry didn't work. They never would come back to our church because they were ashamed. I never knew really why that happened that way. You know, in other words, what, what, what brought that on, you know? But anyway, um, when you do things like that, it just usually don't work, you know? It just usually doesn't turn out good. And uh, it's better to wait and do things the right way. You know, it just is. If he had just come to me and said, I want to start a church over there in that town 12 miles away, I'd have said, man, that's great. <laughs> I mean, it may not have turned out any better, but it, at least, at least it would have been better. So it's good to just do things the right way, so that you know that 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 you got good favor and blessing in everything. You always want to honor God's anointing on what you do. Um, a spirit, a a fruit of. Uh, well, let me see. Make sure I'm getting everything here. Pride has its root and strength in spiritual power. The God of this world fell through pride. Everybody pretty much knows Isaiah 14, I think, that uh, speaking of Lucifer and, uh, and the devil, and also that would go along with Ezekiel 28. Both of those texts speak to Lucifer in his lofty high place in heaven. He was basically the worship leader in the heavens, and he exalted himself above the throne of God, or he tried to, uh, and God kicked him out of heaven. And in so doing, it uh, cost him his position. And he was cast to the earth, and he fell because of pride. And today, people fall because of pride. Pride is a root in rebellion. And it costs people everything today. And we all are subject to the sin of pride. Pride always says, I know better than you do. And that's what the devil was basically saying to God, was, God, I know better than you do. I'm smarter than you. I have more experience. And I want to tell you, folks, in the kingdom of God, it's never about that. That's what happened in the garden, you know. It was all about knowledge. It was all about um, Eve's conversation with the devil. <laughs> Did God say? It's not about what God said or knowledge. It's about obedience. It's just all about obedience. It's about obeying God. Amen? Uh, so the world operates on a principle of pride, and the root of every sin is, and evil is pride. Uh, it's doing what I want to do instead of what God wants. Or it's doing what I want to do or serving myself instead of someone else. I remember my, it's probably been 30 years ago, I remember Dwayne Sheriff just simply giving the definition. He said the difference in pride and humility is pride is self-centered and humility is other-centered. And I've always appreciated that. Pride is self-centered. And humility is other-centered. And I thought, you know, that really helps me. Because it's true, isn't it? Pride is self-centered. Uh, and humility is other-centered. 
So when, when I have something in the Scripture the, and, and I, that God says and I don't like it, <laughs> I have to say, is this God-centered or is this least centered <laughs> And if it's about God, I better get on board, amen. <laughs> if it's about other people, I better get on board. If it's about Lee, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know. And, and I don't mean that in the sense of that God, if God is blessing me, you know what I'm saying, if God is telling me he loves me, y'all understand what I mean. In the, in the area of doing stuff for other people, loving other people, that type of thing. So a fruit of pride is perfectionism. There's a big difference in perfectionism and excellence. And I think we've gone over that in, the pa in past lessons. But excellence is about doing things for the Lord to, to, to bring glory and honor to the Lord. But you do it in the spirit of love and you do it in the spirit of encouragement. Perfectionism is different. Perfectionism is a person who sets up standards for himself beyond the normal requirements. By achieving these, places himself above others and becomes critical of those who do not accept the same standards. Now, a description of this would be a lack of love, indifference to needs of others, insensitive, hasty in judgment, and they have sharp words. Uh, the results of perfectionism would be a harsh attitude towards others and self which results in severity of character, a very critical spirit, unforgiveness, self-righteousness, and a religious pride, poor relationship with God. They transmit rejection to children and others. A child never feels accepted except on a basis of achievement. Uh, a child feels like that mom and dad are never happy unless I'm doing exceptional. And they sometimes feel like that the mom and dad are ashamed of me, you know, if I'm not doing exceptional. This can transfer over into the church. The church can feel like, I mean, not the church. Well, a church can feel like that the pastor is ashamed of them. A worship team can feel like if they're not, you know, performing up to a certain capacity, that the pastor is ashamed or the worship leader is ashamed or, or um, a choir or the Sunday school department can feel like, you know, if, if we're not doing a certain level of uh, uh, growth or, or teaching that maybe the, the CE director is not, uh, is not happy with us or something. When in reality, in all of these cases, they can all be doing a great job. But it's just that if, we, if I have this spirit of perfection on me, I'm communicating this to them. The perfectionist will look at God as a perfectionist. They relate to God on the basis of his achievement. They set high standards for himself, or that God does, God's acceptance is received on the basis of works, life filled with works, but he actually has no relationship with God. These people, are, they, they feel very inadequate in the presence of God. They feel like I can never please God. They try so hard. They feel like I never pray enough. They feel like I never read the Bible enough. They feel like I'm never good enough at church and everything that they do. And they try to do everything so perfect but they're never satisfied because they feel like God's never satisfied with anybody. And that's what happens. It, uh, a fruit of pride is competition. This is constant striving to excel above another, to be first, to be better, to be recognized. Now, you've seen people like this probably. A description would be a selfish, self-willed, self-exalted, ambitious, and envious individual. Uh, the results of competition are uh, enmity between men, constantly comparing oneself to another, discontentment with life and any past achievement, uh, jealousy and envy. Uh, and you, you, you know, occasionally you'll see these people too. It's like they got to always one up the next guy. <laughs> and uh, th this, is, this is a common thing too that you'll see sometimes. The fruit of pride is uh, unforgiveness. Description of this would be unforgiving, bitter, and estranged, touchy, and angry. The result of unforgiveness is guilt and condemnation. They can't release others. They don't have God's release themselves because of their unwillingness to forgive. They can't forgive themselves for the past, and they cannot receive God's unforgiveness. They suffer from blindness and deception. They fail to see themselves as they really are, and they fail to see others as they really are. They're, they have a terrible problem with this bitterness and hatred, which we've already gone over. They have a fruit. Uh, this this uh, person has a fruit of pride. Who has a fruit? The fruit of pride is uh, unbelief. Another fruit of pride is unbelief. And that would be the nature of pride is to be independent and self-sufficient. To believe that one must acknowledge a need, a deficiency, a limitation. 
So unbelief seeks to establish its independence and sufficiency so that no one else is needed. Pride is the root of unbelief. Then we, uh, one cannot believe that God, believe God and seek the glory of men. Pride desires the glory of men. Faith desires the glory of God. Pride feels um, inadequate unless people are telling them how good they did. You know, uh, what a blessing they are. And it is proper to thank people. You know, it's Christian-like. <laughs> it, it, is, it is ethical to appreciate people and show your gratitude and your love. And it is good to make people feel like they, you know, that they did good when they worked hard to do something nice. But at the same time, the pro for the prideful person, it's different. If they don't receive that, they really take it bad. And they really get angry and frustrated and inside. And they may not show it, but they really feel upset about it because that's where they get their self-esteem. Because they're, you know, they, they feed on that thing. Because they've got some issues that are not really right in their heart. One can't believe God and seek the glory of, of men. Um, faith would desire the glory of God. Faith just, know, just knows that, you know, I, I do, I've done what God has asked me to do. And I'm, I'm happy to know that I've obeyed the Lord. And, uh, and that's the main thing that's important. Pride seeks to possess itself of God's blessings characterized by striving with God. Um, Psalms 46.10 says, Be still and know that I am God. Working with faith principles for personal goals rather than seeking God's will for life. And uh, refusing to seek God's will and pleasure in one's life. Faith and humility are the same root. Humility prepares the soul for trust. There's some examples of faith and humility. The centurion says to Jesus, he says, uh, I am not worthy when he asks for Jesus to come and pray for his servant. And he says, you know, I'm not worthy. Yet on the other hand, he's just asked Jesus to come and pray. He had faith in his heart. He knew that, if, you know, that Jesus, if, if, if you will just pray, he basically said, you don't have to come. Just pray, and I know my servant will be healed. He was humble, but he had faith. And then the Gentile woman, she said, the dogs eat the crumbs. You know, um, she was humble, but she had faith. Here's how you cut the root of pride. You ask God to show you the deception of pride. Then you repent. You release the deception of pride. You change the motivation of life from pride to love. And then you humble yourself before God. Um, our foundation text is Revelation 17, 1 through 5. The scripture says, And one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, Come, I will show you the punishment of the great prostitute who sits on, the, on many waters. With her the kings of the earth committed adultery, and the inhabitants of the earth were intoxicated with the wine of her adulteries. And then the angel carried me away in the spirit into a desert. There I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was covered with blasphemous names and had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet and was glittering with gold, precious stones and pearls. She held a golden cup in her hand filled with abominable things and the filth of her adulteries. This title was given on her forehead. Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes and of the abominations of the earth. <clears throat> and then in Deuteronomy chapter 18, Verse 9 through 12. The scripture says, And when you enter the land of the Lord your God is giving you, do not learn to imitate the detestable ways of the nations there. Let no one be found among you who sacrifices his son or daughter in the fire, who practices divination or sorcery, interprets omens, engages in witchcraft or casts spells, or who is a medium or a spiritist, or who consults the dead. Anyone who does these things is detestable to the Lord. 
And because of these detestable practices, the Lord your God will drive out those nations before you. Okay? So these are our foundation texts for this section. Um, <clears throat> uh, the occult involvement gives Satan legal claims over an individual. Spiritual gifts of the occult are passed on from generation to generation. And also the curse comes along with that when they are. The occult has its beginnings in idolatry. And uh, the reason is, is because when you consult something, you are putting your trust and your confidence in that thing. And it, that, that itself lends it to idolatry. The occult is the worship of other gods. These gods work in idolatry and religious systems. They, these gods bring the supernatural to idolatry. Idolatry opens the door to the hidden powers of darkness. Um, these powers are demons. Psalms 106. Verse 35 through 38. The scripture says, But they mingled with the nations and adopted their customs. They worshiped their idols, which became a snare to them. They sacrificed their sons and their daughters to demons. They shed innocent blood, the blood of their sons and daughters, whom they sacrificed to the idols of Canaan. And the land was desecrated by their blood. <clears throat> okay. uh, the first commandment speaks of other gods as well. And, uh, <clears throat> of course, we know that uh, God forbids us to worship only him and him alone uh, to worship other gods but that we are to worship him and him alone amen the occult seeks to manipulate these spiritual forces the demonic forces allow themselves to be used the price for such service means that the complete enslavement of the individual when people seek other gods when people worship other gods uh, obviously um, <coughs> these other gods don't exist they don't have power They're, what's behind them is just evil spirits they're just demons and so demons allow themselves to be used to deceive people uh, the devil doesn't matter what you call him it doesn't matter if you call him by the name of some false god some uh, entity or deity he doesn't care as long as you're not praying to the true god and you're not worshiping the true god and he'll even lend his demonic powers to help deceive people and uh, <clears throat> to manipulate people and, and deceive people's minds. And that this is often how the devil keeps people in idolatrous, idolatrous systems to, to serve him through them thinking they're serving some false god. In my travels in India on several occasions, it, it's just amazing to see the idols and uh, the worship of these idols and to see how really sincere these people are that are in Hinduism and their multitude of gods. Uh, but that's how they've been raised, and that's how that they've been taught. And they're, you know, they until we preach the gospel and, and introduce them to Christ and the delivering power of God, they, along with the multitudes of other people around the world, in animism and different other types of systems of worship, are just deceived. But behind every bit of it is just demonology and false gods. The occult seeks to manipulate these spiritual forces. The demonic forces allow themselves to be used. Uh, the price of such service means the complete enslavement of the individual. Idolatry is the worship of demons. <clears throat> and that's basically exactly what it is. Uh, the occult is the manipulation of demon powers for selfish goals. By establishing common ground, demons enter into agreement with people. The benefits offered through the supernatural always becomes a curse to the benefactor. Supernatural gifts as well as the curse are passed from one generation to another. The curse for bowing before other gods goes to the third and fourth generation according to the, uh, the law and the Ten Commandments. Rebellion against God is the root of the occult. Man in the garden sought hidden knowledge. <clears throat> Genesis 3, verse 5, man rebelled against the command of God and forbidden knowledge was brought, brought him under the authority of darkness. After the flood, man attempted to set up his kingdom and religious system. And then he sought to establish himself as God. The heavens were made the object of his worship. <clears throat> the kingdom of Babylon becomes the center of idolatry. And man discovers the occult. Occultist powers were made available. 
and then knowledge and power become the chief elements of the occult. The occult is a search for destiny and knowledge. There is need for meaning and purpose in living. People are caught up in the fascination of the unknown and all occultism forms attempt to predict the future. Basically, what man seeks, the devil through demonic powers tries to offer him a little bit of in order to keep his attention and keep him captivated. And all it is is enslavement by demonic powers to keep man's focus away from God and to keep him <clears throat> into the dark realm. And so man's own personal seeking and searching for power and for control and for the knowledge of whatever's ahead in the future, the devil uses that to lure him and to manipulate him and control him to keep him away from God. Knowledge and power become the chief elements of the occult. Um, the occult is grasping for power to dominate and control. In other words, it's, it goes all the way back to Genesis 3, 5. You will be like God. When we have every, every loving opportunity to, to live in communion with God and to share God's knowledge and God's wisdom and God's loving care and protection, uh, we, we're just not happy with that. Rebellion, that spirit of rebellion says, no, I, I don't want to receive from God and have the blessings of God. I want to be God. And that's the rebellious spirit in a man. And it comes really from the heart of the devils where it comes from. Um, so anyway, man's potential of subduing the earth is perverted. Man seeks to dominate and control others. And man seeks to have power over the gods. <clears throat> then uh, there are certain uh, results that come from an occult root. There's the spiritual blockage, supernatural control that keeps one from confessing faith in Jesus. An attitude of rebellion against all authority. Spiritual blockage that keeps one from entering the spiritual benefits of the Holy Spirit. And an inability to read the Bible, pray, or worship without being attacked. It just opens up a door that allows an array of problems and difficulties, especially in the area of spirituality when it comes to the things of God. When you entertain the evil realm, you're going to then have it try to block you in the area of all things that pertain to holiness and righteousness. The devil's going to do all he can with the access you have given him to keep you from experiencing the light of the gospel and the presence of God. Physical symptoms will come. Symptoms of paralysis, epilepsy, nervous disorders, anxiety, fear, all kinds of things will come. Children born as freaks, deformities, deaf mutes. Also nervous disorders, learning problems, agitation, inability to function in social structures, fears, and bad dreams. You can see these kind of examples in the Word of God as you read through the, uh, the Gospels. And you see those that Jesus and the uh, apostles of the Lamb ministered to. You can see it in some of the Old Testament examples. You can see it in the book of Acts. And then you can also see it in present day, <clears throat> past, and, past and present examples of people that have uh, messed around in the occult and in the supernatural realm. The, where the devil sows seed and where the devil and his demons work, there is always bad ramifications, both spiritually and physically, and deliverance is needed. There's emotional instability, violent tempers, hatred and cursing, nervous disturbances, unsocial uh, behavior, depression, Fear, insecurity, tormented constantly, bad dreams, mental bondage where there's confusion and thought patterns, uh, learning problems, mental illness. Two questions that most often trouble people about the occult root are how is it possible for a Christian to, to continue suffering oppression and subjection because of, because of earlier pre-conversion experience? <clears throat> And the answer to that, obviously, is that the door open to the powers of darkness will remain open until it's closed by the act of the person's will. An open door is an invitation to oppression. And just like you open the door, you have to close the door. Um, the devil's going to keep coming in as long as it's open. And uh, you have to close that door. So a Christian, uh, can a Christian who has never participated in any form of occultism be subjected to oppression? Occult oppression can be passed on by parents or children. Children can be infected by certain occult blessings sought by parents. And uh, there is a curse to, for entering into an unholy alliance with another God. So these are things that once <clears throat> entered into leave the door open and can affect even others within a household or a family. 
uh, <clears throat> counterfeit of the occult. 2 Corinthians 11, verses 13 through 15. I'm going to look at that. And the scripture says, For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, masquerading as apostles of Christ. No wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It is not surprising, then, if his servants masquerade as servants of righteousness. Their end will be whatever their actions deserve. Okay? So there is, uh, there is reality in the supernatural of the occult. And through the occult, man has discovered the reality of another dimension. That is, the world of the occult is real. Many have ignored the reality of, spiritual, uh, in, in, of the spiritual enemy. And uh, this is really true. A lot, of, a lot of Christians, I'd say, well, I don't want to give a percentage to it, but a lot of Christians, a lot of denominational groups, and just a lot of Christians in general, basically don't even acknowledge the dark realm. Um, there, is, there are even some now that don't even acknowledge hell, <laughs> you know, <coughs> and that's really sad. But, um, and then there's some that acknowledge hell, and they may acknowledge the devil, but they don't give much credence to the fact that demons have anything, you know, really, uh, any activity, or that there's much that goes on. It's all kind of a made-up world to them. And, uh, but the fact is, it is real, and it is true. The world of the occult is real. Many have ignored a spiritual... Uh, the reality of our spiritual enemy. The world of the occult is a supernatural dimension. Many people go on the premise of it's, it's supernatural, then it's God. And man has a supernatural enemy who is a counterfeiter. And that is so true about the devil. The devil tries to, tries to copy God in as many ways as he can. Um, and especially in the area of, in, to deceive people. The kingdom of another dimension is opened by the occult. The occult holds keys that opens doors into this dimension. Spiritism, uh, psychic phenomena, extrasensory perception, divination, magic, and Satanism. Through the occult has come the counterfeit of the truth. The counterfeit of the truth. In other words, the devil masquerading uh, as an angel of light. Trying to appear to be something genuine like a true Christian religion or some other avenue to God or to the Father, when in reality it's, uh, it's either a cult or, or the occult. Uh, there's a true outspearing of the Holy Spirit, which is supernatural. And we read about that, of course, in Joel 2, 28, in Acts chapter 1, verses 5 and 8. And that's the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. <clears throat> Amen. In the true baptism, one receives the Holy Spirit. Counterfeit, one receives an unclean spirit. The Holy Spirit energizes the total person. The unclean spirit brings passivity. Jesus Christ is the baptizer. The counterfeit works through mediums, seances, and so forth. Both are uh, basically in order that the believer or the individual is going to receive power. They're going to receive anointing. They're going to receive the ability to operate in supernatural. And, uh, but one is genuinely the Holy Spirit and one is the unholy spirit. It's what I'll call him. Uh, there are true supernatural gifts of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 11. And we're all familiar with that. These are, true, these are the gifts of revelation, which are broken down in verses 8 and 10, which would be the word of wisdom through the Spirit, the word of knowledge according to the Spirit, the discerning of spirits by the Spirit. But the counterfeit of this has come in the form of clairvoyance uh, and uh, clairaudience. And this is uh, ESP of objects and events. And then the other counterfeit is precognition, which would be knowledge of events not yet taken place. And then telepathy would be direct experience of someone's thoughts. So for what is true of the Holy Spirit, the devil, or what I'm calling the unholy spirit, <laughs> uh, has a counterfeit. And what's really interesting in our day and time is that you, we now have television shows where they actually come on TV and they, they do these things. And they actually almost look like spirit-filled ministers or something ministering, you know. They dress nice and they call people out and they appear to be, you know, doing these things. And it's very, 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 very deceiving. Uh, then we have what uh, would be the true gifts of power, verses 9 and 10 of 1 Corinthians. Um, 
and uh, chapter 12. And the gift of faith would be by the Spirit. The gift of healing would be by the Spirit. And the gift of affecting miracles would be by the Spirit. Now, the counterfeit to this has come in the same forms of faith through concentration of thought and will. And then we have healings through mediums with supernatural power. And we have supernatural manifestations. Okay. Um, then we have the true gifts of inspiration in verse 10 of 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And that would be the gift of prophecy by the inspiration of the Spirit. The gift of tongues by the inspiration of the Spirit. The gift of interpretation by tongues by the Spirit. The counterfeit to these would be in the forms of divination and tongues used by demonic powers. So we see that for what God has given and offered to the body of Christ to be encouraging, edifying, building up of the church, the devil has come along and he has, through his unholy spirit, he has offered counterfeits to these. <coughs> so the discerning of spirits uncovers the deception of the occult. The angel of light are uncovered by discerning of spirits. The witness of deceiving spirits is uncovered by the discerning of spirits. The doctrine of demons is uncovered by the discerning of spirits. And the demon miracle workers are uncovered by the discerning of spirits. And we're giving you uh, scripture references to support each of these four right here. Spiritism is the quest for life after death. Um, spiritism, I think as most of you know, is basically just trying to communicate through that gap between life and death. And uh, Deuteronomy 18.11, we read that just a minute ago. But I'll uh, look it up and read it to you again. 18.11 Or cast out spells, or who is a medium or a spiritist, or who consults the dead. Anyone who does these things is detestable to the Lord. Okay? Uh, so, communication between the dead and the living is uh, the... Uh, Basically what a, a spiritist is. Spiritists use the following scripture references. And. Uh, <clears throat> they will try to try to actually build a doctrine off of these. Matthew eleven fourteen, John the Baptist came in the spirit of Elijah. They'll try to say that. Uh, you know, uh, reincarnation can be an example of the fact that there is life after death. Uh, and we're talking about uh, apart from Christ or apart from the resurrection, you know, apart from the, the, true, the true message in Christianity. And that is heaven and what have you. So they, they use the example of John the Baptist and the fact that he returned in the spirit of Elijah. So what they're, what they're pushing in, as part of their doctrine is reincarnation. And they claim that John the Baptist is really going to be reincarnated, which is not what the Bible is saying at all. And then in John chapter 9, verse 2, they refer to the blind man when, you know, he was, uh, the child was born blind. Or, and they say, well, who sinned? Was it, was it him or his parents? And what they're trying to uh, imply is that maybe he was done, had done, or possibly there was some sin in his past life, you know. That if it wasn't the parent's sin, then maybe the child was born blind because he sinned in his past life and he was born with the birth defect as a result, in implying that there was a past life. You know, it's not said in the scripture, but there's the implication. That's what they're trying to say. And then there was Nicodemus in John 3, 3, you know, <clears throat> um, where Nicodemus says, can a man be born again a second time from his mother's womb? <laughs> the whole thing's talking about spiritual birth, not re reincarnation. But that's the way knotheads do when they try to twist the scripture. So, you know, that's, so they're trying to twist the scripture right there and say, oh, that's talking about reincarnation. But we say, oh, no, that's talking about spiritual birth. <laughs> okay. But anyway, so the next, next topic we move into here is psychic phenomena. And psychic phenomena is referring to doors into the spirit world through psychic phenomena. And you hear the word recently uh, in the last few years, poltergeist. The definition of a poltergeist is a noisy ghost. A noisy ghost. This is uh, uh, an impolite ghost. Okay? And the definition, noisy ghost. Poltergeists presents themselves as spirits of deceased people. 
Poltergeists are attracted to houses where occult practices have occurred. Uh, levitation can be another example of psychic phenomena. And this would be the capacity of a solid object to defy the laws of gravity, to levitate itself with no means of support. And this was uh, a definition by Walter Martin uh, from the book Kingdom of Cults that he wrote. Now, let me say to you, uh, about all of these, we can go on Ouija board, uh, appropriate, uh, appre appreciation, yeah, which is telekinesis. Uh, astral projection, automatic writing, um, let me turn the page, and uh, stigmatata, is that how you say that? Stigmata. Um, <coughs> all of these basically have their own name and it has a specific definition and a meaning and you understand what they are because they're all around us. But in reality, all they are is demonic activity. Okay, if it happens, if you have a poltergeist, if you have a noisy ghost in your attic, what you really have is a demon, <laughs> okay, or a mouse, <laughs> okay, <laughs> or a squirrel, yeah, or something like that, all right, uh, <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay, if something levitates on your dining room table, and it says, it's grandma. <laughs> okay, it ain't grandma <laughs> or whatever. It's just some demonic activity or strong wind coming through the door. All right? That blew the tablecloth. Okay, anyway, so, um, uh, well, you get the point. So this phenomenon of, of levitation is occultist and it's realized through occult powers. Um, the Ouija board, a medium of communication by which a spirit will respond to the questions of the curious. It's a harmless game. Puts, it, a harmless game puts one in contact with the spirit world. And this is the key right here. This is why you don't go and entertain these things. This is why you don't go and participate in these activities. Is because what you're really inviting and what you're really introducing yourself uh, into is, is, the, is with demonic activity. And you, you're, you're stirring up something and you're bringing yourself into contact with, with demon spirits, then you don't want that. And so this is the key. This apportation or telekinesis, this is the moving of small objects from one room to another or even long distances by no visible means. Articles are also carried through walls and locked doors. Sufficient energy is released through occult powers to move solid material objects. If you do it and if it works, it's a demon. Okay, and uh, you know, it's, it's, if you get that kind of response from the devil, you're not going to like the coming responses. <laughs> because uh, the devil never works in conjunction with you just to please you. He's got ulterior motives. Hello? He wants to control your life. And he wants to manipulate you. Astral projection. An individual in a state of consciousness in, is capable of leaving his physical body, traveling long distances, observing other people, recording what they say and do, and he returns to his body and confirms what he saw. Drugs, sorcery, can also induce this kind of a state. Again, same scenario. If this works for you, or if you think it works for you, either way, you're having to entertain demon, demon spirits, evil spirits. You do not want this kind of fellowship with the devil. It, you haven't just tapped into some supernatural power that you're going to enjoy or that's going to benefit you in the long run. You have made an alliance with the devil. It's what you have done. And in order to do this, the outcome and the end results are not going to be in your favor and you're not going to be pleased with it. And you're going to have to have deliverance in all these cases to get free from this because the devil is taking... A